What an amazing day. What are you thinking so far? Pretty incredible. I am, I am applauding those who have gone before me in their courage. I'm excited by the, the ideas that have been here. As I, I'm thinking about what I've learned today about, so for example, we start to look at the, the great new ideas. I'm thinking about failing intelligently. I'm going to be asking myself, what does fail intelligently mean? How could I do more of that? Fail big or go home, right? I'm thinking about eulogizing my failures. I'm thinking about creating a celebration of life lessons out of my failures. What are you thinking about that? I, I, that's, I just think that was a great idea that Brandon had there. I thought that was awesome. I'm thinking about the fact that as we boldly move forward, we're warriors. Warriors on a mission to make a difference by bringing whatever gifts and talents we have into this innovation space and doing it with boldness. Doing this out of, out of a desire to better and make a difference in the world. I think we've learned something today about the fact that failure and success are cousins. In fact, I dare say that there's a bit of a hypothesis we've been exploring that potentially success doesn't come in spite of failure. It comes because of it. And there's something about beginning to understand that and explore that and get excited about that and seeing that differently that I think awakens something new in us. Now, I want to take it a little bit further today. I just, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on my own story, but we've all been asked to share a little bit of our own story. I own a learning and development firm called Strength Strategy. It is a firm that actually works to create this analytic, analytical, structured approach to practically applying strengths to move the needle on performance and to be able to measure what happens as a result. We started five years in a room with a, a, a go with in a room of about nine people. And we started with a couple of days of content and materials and a lot of passion and a desire to help people see themselves differently and be able to leverage what was great inside of themselves to create positive change. Now, here's what's interesting. We actually didn't fail right off the bat. We had success that created failure. That's very interesting. 20% quarter over quarter growth for nine straight quarters. And when you're a young new firm and you don't know what you're doing, which thank you very much, we did not, uh, we actually got to, to a point where we flatlined. Because you can't do that. That's not sustainable. Not when you're still kind of new and in, young in the market. Now what I want to do is I don't want to tell you so much about the story today as I want to begin to tell you about what, what actually has to happen in those moments when we feel like we're flatlining in life or in our own creative process? And how do we get back up and how do we get out? Now, we've been talking today about learning from failure. Well, I would like to suggest to you that there are a couple of things we can look for. We can go back into our failure and look for failure. Or we can go back into our failure and look for success. I want you to know that whatever you're, you're going to look for, you'll find. So today, I want to teach you about a tool that we used when we flatlined to be able to figure out how to get back up and move again. It is a strength-based tool. It is a tool called appreciative inquiry. Appreciative, meaning that we look back at what has happened through appreciative in in eyes. We look forward to what is hopeful and possible through appreciative eyes. Now, rather than tell you about it, you've heard everybody else's stories I want to give you a chance to share your own. I need everybody to stand up and grab a partner and go back to back so everybody can see who's got somebody. You're going to have a conversation. This is going to be brief. Everybody needs someone to talk to. So move. Find someone. Everybody find a partner. Find a partner. OK, are you ready? Everybody got somebody? Don't be shy. OK, everybody's had a chance to hear stories. Now we're going to share some stories. Now here's how it's going to look. You will have three minutes and three minutes. So we're going to go boom, 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 pretty quick here. And here is what you're going to look at. Number one, I want you to go back to a time when you were experiencing failure. And I don't want you to look for the failure. I want you to say, where in that failure was there success? Where was there a nugget of something you did right? Something that worked? What was it? Most of the time, it's not all failure. It's some failure and some success. So find the nugget of success. Then I want you to ask a second question. Imagine that it's a year from today. You've experienced remarkable success now in some new venture that you want to be working on. 
what are the outcomes that are being produced? And the last question would be, how did you take a past positive success and now use it as you go forward? So three minutes, three questions, it's gonna go quick like that. Off you go, I'm gonna give you the signal at the three minute mark so that you know to, to switch roles. Okay, so turn around. You gotta talk to each other this way. You can, you can turn around. You, you guys can turn around. <laughs> Okay, you should, you should be switching roles. Switch roles. Make sure both people get to share. One minute. How are you two doing? Are you finding your nuggets of success? Yeah, You're fishing. Efficient. We're very efficient with our I can stories. We got it. You've got it down. I can see this. Good. <laughs> okay. That's a pause. Come back. Come back. Pause and come back. Take your seats. Pause, take your seat. What? Oh, light. Yeah, there we go. Okay, folks, here's the million dollar question. What is it like to go back to the moment of failure and look for the success in the failure? What's it like? Yeah, so what did it feel like? What was the energy like as you were talking? Okay, so the, yeah, so the energy feels like this, so we're not doing this, going back to David's point. It's interesting, I want you to notice there's something about this appreciative inquiry experience that physically takes us from this to this to this, because there is always going to be both. See, the truth of it is, in our process of creating, in our process of innovating, there are moments that are utterly exhilarating. And it feels amazing and incredible, and we're nailing it. Now, what's also true is that sometimes in the process of creating, we hit level five rapids and we're going, ah, oh no. 
<laughs> it's that moment of knowing you are about to go over a waterfall, and it's scary. There are moments when this happens, and you feel like you're utterly capsized. There are also moments when we just feel simply stuck, and we don't know how to get out. Now, it's kind of funny. David and I did not talk before we came, but it's very interesting. Let me, let me point you to, I want to add on to and build on to what David has just taught you. Because what I want to suggest to you is something like this. We have these moments that come, whether it is that we're about to go over a level five rapid and we start to feel anxious, or you have the moment when you're capsized and you're upside down and go, oh, wow, I really, I really messed it up. Or the moments when you're stuck on a rock and you feel just like you've failed. And I am a failure. Now, we have these whitewater events, whatever they are. We often think that there, this feeling that naturally occurs is the result of the event. We blame the event. We feel frustrated. We feel fearful. We feel whatever we feel, which then leads us to stop. And sometimes what I would want you to know is that there is this reality that we're missing, that it is not really the event that caused the frustration or the fear or the stoppage. It's the way we choose to see it. Now, this is really an important thing, what I'm about to share, because we live in a world where we get stuck often while these three things are always present before us, our past experience looms with many years where we might have made mistakes. And when we make mistakes, this is often the kind of self-talk that goes on. Oh, if only I would have done that. If I hadn't done that, then this. I wish I would have. I should have. I failed to. Therefore, and what ends up happening is we then get trapped in comparing ourselves to others, to judging ourselves, and to a feeling of fear, a feeling of frustration. And it holds us hostage. In fact, what's interesting is we will take it, we will project that forward. Now we're in the present moment, but we've already taken all those past fears. It was just like David's story. And we forward them before they've even had a chance to emerge into our life. I missed out before, therefore again. I can't because, and we have all this past evidence that we draw out of our memories. And literally what it means is this. In the moment, we are not present in the present with what's here. We're not present with our own possible contribution. We're not present to our own solutions. We get stuck. Now, I want you to recognize it doesn't have to be this way. The thing that's amazing is we can actually choose a different way of thinking. Now we're going to go back to active thinking as opposed to automatic, where we actively go in and we change the belief and we change where we're looking. So we could go from a deficit mindset. I want you to know we live in a world that enthrones deficit thinking. It says, I'm successful when I fix everything that's wrong. Well, when you start by looking at what's wrong, what do you get? What's it feel like? I'm this again. But when we can go back, as we look at what's happened in the past, and we can look for where the success was, we move into possibility thinking. It allows us to get to understanding and acceptance and move into using the strengths and the insight that we've been given to then contribute forward to make positive change to come up with some solution. Here's what I want you to recognize. Always, always in the corner of your mind, you've got these two competing wavelengths. They're always present. You've got the deficit thinking, wavelength that prompts you to look at what's wrong. And you've been schooled, you've been taught from the time you're little. You've got the possibility thinking wavelength that says there's a way that you, you have the talent, the strengths, the intellect, the resources here and around you if you know where to look. Whichever story you empower will dwarf the other. So when we go to that deficit past future thing, we dwarf the present. We dwarf our ability to tap into the present possibilities of what's here. However, when we switch it, when we begin to look at what's possible, then we can change that reality. Now, what I want to present to you today is there is a very simple way that we can begin to step into possibility thinking. I want to teach you a tool. 
Now, this appreciative inquiry tool has its own sets of beliefs. The beliefs begin to shift then how we feel, which shift what we do. When we change and add that middle place with this appreciative look, we can then begin to shift how we're engaging with the failure and experiences in our life. Now, here are the assumptions. <laughs> Always, something is working well. We gotta find what it is, mine it. We grow toward the things that we question. Whatever we focus on becomes our reality. You focus on failure, you get more failure. You focus on possibility, you focus on the success and the su success patterns, you get more of that. It fuels your energy. What we want is right inside of us. It's in us, it's around us, it's available to us if we're looking for it. Again, the posture of failure is so much this, we get looking down and we don't think or notice what's right here, right here, right here. The final thing, and I think I love this reminder that as we move into the future, we're more confident if we can hold on to the past. If I can find a nugget, I, I, I may have a huge pile of failure, but somewhere in there, maybe there was a moment of success, something that worked. If I can find that and leverage that going forward, that will give me momentum and it will give me power that will enable me then to see different solutions and find different possibilities, okay? Here's how we do it. This is actually very simple. The appreciative inquiry process, by the way, I just want you to know we, we didn't invent it. David, David Cooperfield did. This discovery process begins with a story. We always start with a story. Tell me a time in your past creation when you were successful. What did you do to make it happen? Now we're going to sharpen the focus. What did you value about that? What was important about that? What was the impact of what you did? So you start to notice how that creates positive ripples. Now, that's not where we're going to stay because we want to be able to project forward. We're going to use the success as we move into and imagine a different future. Ironically, often, when we go back and we look at failure and we start to analyze failure and get caught in the deficit and the negative swirl that comes, I want you to recognize that when you go into an imagined process, but you carry with you this wealth of wisdom, you can actually get at the same process without doing it from a deficit mindset. And this is how we do it. So imagine it's a year from today. Things are exactly as you wish they were. Now you're, you're creating again. And you're imagining the ideal creation and the way it would look, and you're going, what are the results being produced? In ways that please your stakeholders and your valued end users. What are you doing differently to create the results? And you begin to imagine, and the energy feels so different. It's not from a place of beating yourself up for what you did wrong. It's a place of going, and this is possible, and this is possible, and this is possible. You take and you integrate your past success. You take what you've learned from your failure, and all of it gets wrapped into this process. And then you begin to design differently. And in the design, we always want to start with who are the key stakeholders? How would you and they define success? What objectives are you trying to meet? And how would you know they're successful? I don't know that you know that the Project Management Institute says this right here is the number one cause of project failure. When we start to innovate and we start to create and we start to build new projects, if we're not clear about our key stakeholders, we're not clear how they would define success and we do not have clear success measures, then we, the likelihood of our failure increases. So in the design process, we want to get very clear about this. Now, what I know is this. <laughs> there are acres of diamonds in the failure right before your eyes. There are all kinds of nuggets, and they're brilliant. There are nuggets in the failure. There are nuggets in the success, and they are treasures. And when we know where to look, we can then leverage it. Now, let me do one final thing with you. Let me share one final thing, a powerful story to remind you to look for the acres of diamonds in your own, in your own backyard. This is a story that Russell Cronwell made famous in his 100, 100 top speeches in America. It's a story called Acres of Diamonds. It's a true story. A story about a man named Ali Hafen. He was a Persian. He lived in the early 1900s near the River Indus, had a beautiful farm, wealthy orchards, family. He had everything, he was content. 
Until one day, a wise friend of his, a traveling friend, friend, a man that he looked up to and admired, they sat one evening around the fire and his friend began to tell him of his most recent travels and the finding of a diamond mine in his travels. Now as they spoke, he said, Oh, Ali, he said, as I saw this, it was the most wonderful thing if you had a diamond only the size of your thumb. You could place your children on thrones. You would be wealthy beyond your fondest dreams. You'd never have to farm when you're old. And that night, Ali Hafid went to bed a poor man. All he could dream about was holding diamonds in his hands. All he could dream about is what he did not yet have and how he had failed his family in this farm when there were diamonds possible. The next day, he went to find his wise friend, and he said, tell me, where are the diamonds? How do I get them? Where do I look? And the wise man will say, this is easy, Ali Hafen. You must just go find them. You must look for a white sand river between high mountains. Now, I'm going to give you a little hint here, because this is also a picture of the river Indus near his home. Go find a white sand river, he said, between the high mountains and stir up the white sand and see if you don't find diamonds. Well, Ali Hafid decided that's exactly what he was going to do. He puts his farm up for sale, he puts his family in the care of neighbors, and off he goes. He begins at the mountain of the moons, finds no diamonds. Off into Palestine, finds no diamonds. Up over into Europe, no diamonds. This is now several years later. Everything from the sale of his farm is gone. He finds himself at the pillars of Hercules on the shores of Barcelona. And as he watches the tide come in, in a spirit of despondency, he throws himself into the ocean and decides that he is done searching. He does not want to go home a failure. Now, that is at the end of the story, luckily for you and I. Many years later, the man who bought Ali Hafen's farm at the end of the day, he paused to water his camel after a hard day of work. And he followed the camel's nose down to the water and noticed a bright flash of light. Beautiful and unusual looking rock with the hue of a rainbow in it as he held it up to the sun. He thought, that is unusual. He takes it home and he puts it on his fireplace mantle, thinks nothing of it. Many months later, he found himself with a visitor at his door, the same wise man, the friend of Ali Hafid. And as they begin to talk across the room, this man notices the fireplace mantle, rushes to it, takes it down and said, has Ali, Ali Hafid come back? He said, no. He said, this rock, where did you find it? He said, oh, that. That came from the creek in my backyard. He said, do you know the diamonds I saw so many years ago in my travels. Are there more? He said, oh yes, many more. The creek is full of them. And they went out, and they began to stir up the water, and lo, the river was full of them. The Golconda diamond mine, the largest diamond mine in history, was found right here, after Ali Hafid died. It produced the crown of jewels for England and Russia. Now, my friends, what are your diamonds? Where are you looking? What do you know? When you look at your own failures, there are also brilliant successes. There are diamonds, to, treasures to be mined. What are yours? Truly, success does not come in spite of failure. It comes because of it. If you'll look, if you'll look for the diamonds. So with that, thank you, and it's been a delight to be with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>